Welcome back to the Undone Podcast, episode 11. Don't say. Episode 11. Um, that's, it's a good sign that we made it past 10 because I feel like it gets, it gets real after 10. Anybody <laughs> can do 10 episodes. <laughs> but we're for sure going to make it to 20 now. So, right. You know, I mean, unless we run out of things to talk about, which well, I can't imagine that happening. Church hadn't run out of things to talk about in 2,000 years. Surely we will not run out of things to talk about. I'm looking forward to... I'm sure this will be way down the road, but when we start revisiting stuff. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, my my whole theological journey is uh, revisiting stuff. And we stuff. can be like, look, look at this thing we said. How silly. I can't wait for that either. That'll be fun. I'll be like, look how dumb you were then. <laughs> to me? <laughs> how literally dare you? Speaking of dumb, I dropped my ladder. Tell me on about a roof. this. So I've been cleaning gutters and doing some small pressure washing gigs and... Uh, I was on my sister's roof at her rental property. No one was there but me and my two boys. I'm glad you brought them. Six years old and four years old. Yeah. And uh, my ladder just fell right on over off them gutters, and I was standing there with a water hose and no way down, but God provided. And uh, my oldest offspring was able to tie the water hose around the ladder, and I hoisted it back up on the roof so I was safe. But I didn't know if I was going to have to be like, Help! You it was it your aluminum extension ladder? Yeah, but I mean, I, he wasn't strong enough. He couldn't have reset it. Of course not. But I, that's what I was wondering when you pulled it up. Did it not like dislodge? Oh yeah. Oh no, no. But it did start to go, and I was having to be real, real uh, careful with how I pulled it up to not just extend it all the way. Yeah, and what you got to understand about Dylan is he knows how to preach, but he does not know how to do anything else. Anything else. He the, he built our float for the White House <laughs> Christmas parade. And it fell completely to pieces on the way there in the wind. Ow. <laughs> I still have pieces flying out of the bed of my truck that I had to pick up on the way home. I actually found another piece yesterday on Sage Road in White House. Really? I was like, hey, that's a piece of our float right there. You went down Sage? Yeah. I didn't know you went there. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why I didn't find it because I did not go there. He sent me on the way there. He said, hey, Ben, uh, I've lost all of our float on the way here. If you could just look around for pieces of it, we'll try to make the best of it when we get here. Look, it wasn't, it wasn't my best work. We were doing the Polar Express. And our float looked phenomenal the night before. It did look good. I, I will say this. I didn't tell you this, but I, I told Robin uh, probably Monday night before. I said, I'm a little worried about the paint because... I think he thinks he's just going to paint it right before we do this. I did it the day before. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that paint was wet. So well, it's because it was in a barn. It rained. The air was, was saturated with the moisture. It wasn't It wasn't a good situation. That paint was wet as one the of, ocean was of, wet. <laughs> it, it was like you had taken the can and just dumped it along <laughs> I, I picked up a piece on the way there. I was like, oh, there's one. There's a red piece I picked up. It was soaking wet. And I said, I'm not putting that in my truck. Maybe for our YouTubers, you should post a picture in the video here. Of You know what I would do? I would <coughs> post a picture and then like uh, get my recorder. I have a recorder. Remember when everybody did recorders in the fifth grade? You learned Hot how to, cross buns. Yeah. And just like do the Polar Express theme really bad like they do in those <laughs> reels <laughs> as we're scrolling across. <laughs> it looked awful. It looked And there was two other groups that churches or whatever us. they did it's a competition also which that's makes it even more embarrassing that we thought this stood a chance um but no, it didn't there was two other polar expresses they were both you know way better than ours that's the way things happen on the polar express that's all right i i, I got some ideas and from it speaking of i'm fired from the float committee next year this is a great segue into church discipline oh oh you you've, but you fired yourself well, yeah, that's, you know, it's time. Okay. All right. Well, he stepped down. <laughs> He's, he has removed himself from the office of float coordinator. I'm out. All right. Well, um, yeah, uh, you know, and about that same time, I brutalized my facial hair because I've been growing uh, just this monstrous, glorious beard, and I've never grown one this long before, and I, it started off in October, and I just was being lazy and wasn't shaving, but then it hit no shave November, and I was like, well, I have to participate, so I can't shave now. Then I got through November, and I was like, man, this is, I mean, I feel like I've hit a groove here. I'm just going to keep going. And then my wife said, I can't even see your mouth. 
my my upper lip had it had grown all the way past my lower lip. You know, Adam got cursed for listening to his wife. That's what the scripture <laughs> says. Well, I did get cursed. I I tried to trim it, and then it started to look like Lego mustache. And so I tried to even it out, and I took more and more. And then before I knew it, the whole thing was gone, and I looked. You look Amish. I looked like an Amish guy, and you I do. told her I did. And she said, "No, you don't." And the moment I showed up to the parade, you first words out of you and and your mom's mouth yeah. was. You look Amish. Yep, that's right. And then my mom said, I know you think he looks Amish, to which I said, I don't think he looks Amish. He looks Amish. I had someone say I looked like Abraham Lincoln. No, you don't look like him. You look like Benadiah or something, like you've been out building barns with some wooden hammers or something. Yeah, so uh, anyways. Do you ride your mule here? I'm going to be shaving this eventually. I think at this point, I just want to get through the end of the year. I think I can get there. I had someone today. I think you should let it go. You got a fantastic beard. Look, today, thank you, first of all. But <laughs> we we went, uh, Robin and I, my wife, we went to the little Thai place next to the coffee shop. And someone that I know was there. And they were looking over at us. I didn't know they were there. They were looking over at us and trying to figure out who my wife was eating lunch with. Wow. Because they did not recognize me, in case you didn't pick up on what that was. So, at this point, you know, I'm giving people concerns of infidelity. I, I, might, have to sh- I might have to shave this thing. Rumors get started. People of the church. They got to do Matthew 18. They got to go to their brother. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. They did. I got to say that. They went to their brother and they were like, who are you? Who? Who? <laughs> What are you doing here? What are you doing here with this woman? Um, okay, so today, so last week we started the just the like what is the church kind of thing and, and kind of went through a bunch of scriptures that talk about the gathering and what it is. And, and I don't want to necessarily rehash all of that, but kind of the immediate follow up was well, in today's context, we become members of churches. And this is not new, although some people may think it's new. And what is sort of tied in with membership, and and I think we can unpack this fairly easily, is church discipline. It kind of is almost becomes like this uh, one topic thing. So it was, it's kind of not possible to talk about one without the other. And I think that it's a delicate topic because for some reason, uh, and I think I can, I could just if I was just picking out reasons, I think I'd probably name four or five reasons why I think that this is a sensitive topic, and they're they're. Some of them are for good reasons, but most of them have to do with just our Western culture in probably the last 50 years or so, like a rapid increase of questioning church membership. Like it didn't used to be that way. It was a foregone conclusion. Of course, you're a member of your church. But in more recent years, I think there's been reasons that people have felt like um, either it's unnecessary, like they're confused about why should I even become a member of a church? So there hasn't been great teaching on it, I think. Or they think that, you know, as soon as you become a member, all of a sudden you get abused by leadership. And and I think some of that has probably... Unfortunately, that happens That happens. That that does happen. Um, I think overall, though, tell me what you think of this. I think you don't even have to look at the church to see that our culture just has a major problem with authority in general. So I think that contributes. I think we want to look at the church and say, oh yeah, it's it's abuse of authority in the church. And that's true. It happens. It does happen. But I think overall, the real problem is you have, um, I'm going to say broad brush here. Go ahead, and, go ahead and acknowledge that. We have a lot of fatherless homes in the United States of America. Uh, and not necessarily... The father is physically absent, although that's definitely true. There's a lot of fathers that are there, but might as well be absent mm. because they're not fathering and leading their home. So the concept of submitting to any kind of authority has start to, started to become just completely foreign to the American household. So then we look at the news and all the, the riots and the uprisings in the streets, and we see people that have no respect whatsoever for any sort of authority and of course this net this necessarily yields to just outright anarchy or chaos and we're all sitting here wondering well, when's it going to end who's going to fix this and it kind of comes down to are we ever going to implement in our homes the concept of an authority look there's there's an order to the way that this is done and what do you have without order chaos and, that, and I think that that's kind of what we see in our culture and that naturally that means that it has invaded the church and so the first little mention 
of okay today we're going to read a little bit about authority and people are pack, they're, they're packing their bags and heading out the door they don't want nothing to do with this they mm. want to be a part of a group of people that is little more than uh like all the moms on the baseball team <laughs> essentially that's what they want like I don't have any real skin in the game here. You know, our kids like to play together and we and we come here and we hang out, but it's it's more or less just a community gathering. It has very little to do with submitting to any type of authority. So if you can't submit to authority, then the authority of the word of God I, doesn't mean anything to you. Yeah. And these things just feed each other. Because all think. authority is resting under the word of God. Right. That is the authority. Well, we, we've even said, it, when we first started this podcast... Uh, speaking for myself, I've, I've said this over and over again. I would have always told you that I believe the word of of God is it's inspired by God. It's infallible. It's inerrant. But these were largely empty words for me because when I, when you uh, when you put them in practice, um, I wouldn't say I was submitting to them. I, I would have thought I was, but it was just because I had a basic understanding that was spoon fed to me my whole life. About, you were agreeable. Yeah, I was like, yeah, it's this is I can see the benefits, and and I and I wouldn't want to not be involved in a church, and and I'm not going to listen to somebody tell me that something in the Bible's wrong that I just intuitively know is wrong. But I'm not going to be able to point to them why it's wrong. It's just yeah. my culture says it's wrong. My culture was raised in. When we made started this podcast, it was kind of on the heels of, I, personally, I had made a decision as I was studying church history that uh, Sola Scriptura was sound, good doctrine, and that, that I, there had to be a measuring rod for absolutely anything we believe. If I was going to say that Christ is Lord, where did I get that? I, I didn't get that from my pastor. I mean, I, I might be able to point to him and say he's the first person I heard it from, or or I listened, I watched this Easter cantata when I was nine years old, and I saw Jesus get lifted up onto a foam cross, and yes. they made the hammer noises, and I believe... I can point to those, but where did all that come from? Chase it down the line, it came from this, right here. So... Th- whether we like it or not, our entire knowledge, aside from just the Holy Spirit himself, is this revealed word of God. And and so I just, I came to a place where I had to just bow my head uh, or bow my knee to this word. And once I did that, it started revealing to me in my past that I, I, I was not really submitting yeah. to the word of God. I barely knew what half of it said or how it tied together. I heard somebody the other day, you know, tell me he's like a uh, longtime per- friend of mine that has gone to the church his whole life, and and he said, you know, I just feel like the the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are like two different gods, and I was like, oh man, I I bet I was there, yeah, not too long ago. Uh, not that I would ever say they were, but I, I didn't know how to reconcile them because I'm just looking at, well, it looks like he behaved different back then and he was real mad back then. And then he's real, ni- <laughs> he's real nice now. And, and I wouldn't be able to tie it together. And, and now when I started to submit to the authority of scripture, first of all, the very first thing that I was able to do was explain the gospel for the first time ever. And it, and this is supernatural thing I believe happened. The moment that I was capable of articulating the gospel, people started coming out of the woodworks that need to hear it. Now, were they always there? I don't know. Don't think God would have sent them to me. I would have been able to articulate it well. I would have just, I would have had to say, well, you know, one time uh, I felt God in this and that, and I, and I believe this. And in the moment that they would have said why, I would have been like, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I, I believe it. It's it's convincing. And, and, and just the moment I was able to articulate it, which all had to do with submitting to it and reading it to actually learn the truth. Uh, it's like God was like, okay, now I'm going to send you some people. Here they go. Here they go. Here they go. Go to him. He knows. You know, and that's not to puff myself up. It's just to, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of trying to call it's, anybody who's here, who's listening. I'm trying, I'm trying to call you to something more like just, you know, this, this is re- fairly recent for me, this deep dive. And, and I'm just, you know, I find myself, I get excited about it and I'm like, okay, well, God's been really patient with me on this stuff. So I need to be patient with these other people and not beat them over the head with it. But I'm just like, Oh man, just go a little further because it just, it gets unlocked. And all of a sudden it's like, this makes so much more sense. There's a scripture that gets taken out of context a lot. And that is from John the Baptist. When he says one is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy spirit and with fire. Mm -hmm. Now a good charismatic Pentecostal church will be like fire, fire of God. Yeah. But if you keep reading like the next two verses talk about, judgment about the winnowing fork and the wheat and the chaff being burned up in the fire and that verse is really talking about god's gonna 
Jesus is coming to give you the Holy Spirit and baptize you with God's judgment. Of course, we're sheltered in his righteousness, but Mm -hmm. that fire is meant to burn up the impurities and refine you. And it's not a, it's not some, I'm, it's, it's exciting in a sense of you're a new creation, but it's actually a, it should come with a, a trepidation, like a, a reverence and a, a godly fear of his judgment rather than a look at these cool magic tricks. Yeah. I was, I was just telling Robin at lunch, you know, um, I get frustrated because since since this change happened in me, I'm I'm obviously focusing a whole lot more on the text. And so what this looks like to people that aren't interested in doing that is it looks like I'm pitted against emotions or against feelings. And uh and I'm not at all. I love feelings. I love emotions. But to somebody who follows their feelings and their emotions, if I say, well, hold on a second, what does the text say? you think that I somehow don't have the power of the Holy Ghost or, or I don't, you know, I'm denying that we have emotions. I'm, first of all, I just want to say, how about, how dare you take emotions from me? I'm a very emotional person. I just want my emotions to be dictated by truth and yeah. not the other way around. I don't want to define what I believe by what I feel. The heart is deceptive above all else. I mean, you follow your heart. You are a fool. I mean, the Bible tells us this. How do you know that unless you place the Bible ahead of your feelings like you you can't trust what's in here but you can trust what's in here and that's ultimately i think what we did and and this really this conversation came up because we were talking about when people leave the church yeah and and what their reasonings are and and what they say and it was very much on topic with kind of what we're going to discuss here today so i heard an illustration by isaiah saldivar and i'm not endorsing this dude's ministry he's real into the deliverance thing and i'm not i believe deliverance is biblical i don't know the exact application of it of course what about the shape of the earth (laughs) that's funny you say that (laughs) so i was reading today about how the lord's servant must be able to teach with patience and gentleness that's tough uh, Tough that didn't happen in that debate you're referencing between <laughs> Pastor Greg and that other man. Oh. Uh, anyways, uh, so <laughs> Isaiah was given this illustration, and again, I'm not I'm not saying I endorse the whole guy's ministry. I just thought this was a great illustration of church, and especially in light of church discipline. He was talking about how uh, people treat church like the gym. How most Americans, mi- most of the people actually watching this podcast, probably have a gym membership. We've all had gym memberships and gone twice and still have the membership. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And uh, many people treat church this way where they've joined the church. They have they have, they have have a signed covenant. They are members there, but they either sporadically attend or, like many people in the gym, when they show up, they, they sit on the bench and play on their phone and watch other people work out. And they expect that what the other person is doing to affect their health, which... Mm-hmm. That don't, it doesn't matter if you're at the gym. It matters if you're doing the gym. Right. If you're doing the exercises. Are you doing the gym? Are you gymming or <laughs> are, are you not? But The uh, people are the gym. <laughs> the people. So as as uh, I, I heard this illustration, I immediately thought of church discipline. So I've, I've been in some form of full-time ministry for about 10 years now. And what I have found is there are two really extreme positions as it pertains to church leadership and church discipline. And the one is the people that have probably put church leadership in a, in a, in a, on a pedestal or in a place that it doesn't biblically belong as if it's King or if, as if it's, you know, the, the voice of God in that person's life. And I would say, no, the Bible is the voice of God. Uh, and the the best illustration I've been able to come up with is church leadership or just guardrails to keep you on the highway. But Jesus is the highway. His word is the light. Like it, there, there's not there's not some like profound understanding of the word. So church leadership is like the speed limit kind of maybe. Okay, and maybe, you and you yeah. obey the speed limit at all times. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, I set him up so easily. Uh, that's not what we're talking about today, Ben. <laughs> Sorry. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, then there's the other end of the spectrum of people that, you know, they're they're like the gym goer that has membership and doesn't show up. They they want to feel like they're part of the church. But if you ever actually start to have a hard conversation with them, I feel like God's calling our family somewhere else right now. Not being fed. I'm not. Oh, yeah, I'm not. I'm just I don't feel like I'm being fed right now. And I just <laughs> yeah, it's like these two. ends. like, hey, can can we meet in the middle? Can we can we just submit to the word of God here? Uh, and I, 
I was thinking about that illustration, and I think that when I look at at our church at Stone Chapel specifically, that's the only one I really have, you know, represent, sight represent of right represent. <laughs> um, uh, if when I when I look at our church, I see people that uh, I, I see something really special in our people, in that many of them, not all, certainly not all, and it probably will never be all, but many of them we've had hard conversations with and the i i have seen more growth in stone chapel and maybe this is just the vantage point i have now uh but i've seen so much growth in the people of stone chapel because of hard conversations and i've seen more people in the last we're almost three years old two and a half years old right now i've seen more people leave stone chapel than I've recognized in years past. Now, this is the smallest church I've been a part of. So, of course, it's a little more evident when somebody goes missing. It's more in percentage for sure. sure. Oh, my word. Yes. Yeah. But when I look at each person that's left, uh, you know, I always want to I always want to make sure um, that, you know, I, I, I did my job that me and me and the elders and, and, the, and the volunteers of Stone Chapel that we properly cared for the for the people. I always want to. I always want to introspect and see what can I do better. And with all of them that have left, there was something I could do better. Nobody. I was like, I perfectly served that family, and I can't believe that they've abandoned us like this. Right. You know, of, uh, there's always something that I'm like, I I could have I could have done this different. I could have said this way. You know, I I, I should have said this sooner. Often, it's I should have said this sooner. Um, but most of the time when they leave, it's. I don't want to submit to these hard conversations. It is it is it is actually a statement to me often of I don't actually want to grow into the image of Christ. I just want to feel good about my life. I yeah. want to, I want to feel good about my efforts here. Yeah. And it's just so detrimental to be in that place of nobody nobody can tell me anything. Right. It's like well then no one's going to tell you anything. Yeah, and I think uh I mean you you sort of like tiptoe on on tiptoed onto another side of this issue, which is here's the deal with church. We're going to get into a little bit about, you know, obviously what the, what the actual text of scripture says regarding church discipline. And there's plenty. So this is not something where we're stretching something. It's there, man. You, you, you can ignore it, I guess, if you want to. Uh, but when you slip out and remove yourself and you got all your reasons but you but you don't bring it up. Let's say let's say you got a legitimate complaint against Dylan. He's he did something inappropriate or wrong or whatever and you're so offended you leave. Well, part of the problem is you didn't you obviously don't have any concept of submitting to uh church authority so you don't you don't even want to address it. But in this case, if he did something wrong, you owe it to him and, and the, the rest church. of the church to address it and not to slip out. Part of the church discipline is, hey, I'm a church member. This is wrong. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation. When you slip out, you've robbed the church of that ability to correct itself. So this isn't just about everybody. Everybody, I think, looks at church discipline as we circle the wagons around our elders. We protect them at all costs. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That is that's an unbiblical model. And actually, I think the church is being judged for that right now all oh, over man. the planet. Yeah. Uh, for for pastors and elders who are being protected against immoral behavior for decades. And and I think the age of of that sort of unaccountability. Thank God. I think it's actually being purged. And and we're gonna have a better. Um, you know, I don't know who, who knows this is me yeah. trying to predict the future, but I feel like the future looks bright for churches that are unwilling to, um, allow anything like that anymore. There's always going to be bad apples, but when, when you have a grievance, right, wrong, whatever it is, we don't even know if it's right or wrong because you didn't address it. You just, you just slipped out unnoticed and you think it's unnoticed and then you complain because you weren't noticed. And it's like, <laughs> you know, and, and you hear it through the grapevine, it comes back to you that somebody's mad because nobody chased you down as you were running outside the door. And I, I'm just, you left the gathering. I'm sorry. And, and, and then I just want to say this, say this, and I may have mentioned this before, but I think that there is a major distinction about leaving the 99 to, to chase the lost sheep versus leaving the 99 to chase the disgruntled sheep who's just, 
He's just mad about something, and he wants you to follow him out the door so y'all can argue out there in the parking lot somewhere. And it's you may be lost. You probably are lost. I mean, if we're going to be honest, but but that's a separate issue because you don't care about whether or not you're lost. You just care about you're mad and you want everybody else to know it, but you're not willing to actually confront it where it could be dealt with and where it could be f- actually fixed. Yeah. I think uh, it's just healthy for the body. I forget the title of the book, um, but it was uh, the, it's the idea. I'll, I'll try to remember the title and post it in the comments here or something afterwards. Um, but the book is the idea that the, the issue of church discipline rests on the entirety of the church. Yeah. The laity, all of it. I, I got a scripture for that. Well, let's jump into the word of God. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So let's see here. Now, the, the, the reason that I think these are so uh, intertwined, church membership and, uh, and church discipline, is because... How many times have you tried to have, I'll just ask you this question. How many times have you tried to explain a biblical concept to somebody, but then they come back to you and say, um, that's not found in the Bible. And you say, you know, the, the, the stereotypical easy one is to say, right. The, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the, yeah. the principle of the Trinity is painted beautifully throughout all the texts of scripture God is a triune God, three persons, one God. Yeah. It's there, man. That's why people bled and died to protect this, yeah. this doctrine. But somebody's going to come to you and say, Lord, Trinity is not in there. We do that with all sorts of very biblical doctrines because it's the easiest way to get what we want and to cause somebody else that should be able to point to it, go, uh, 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 hold on a second. Hold on. Let me think. Let me think. Let me think. It's in there. It's in, I know it's in there. Okay. So church membership is one of those issues. It's very easy to say a church membership's not in scripture, but what is in scripture is, is, uh, definitions of a group of people that is somehow identified. You can't, uh, it's implied in the text, for example. So if you have to take uh, church discipline to the full extent to excommunicating somebody, what are they being excommunicated from? It, there's obviously a group of people that's identifiable that is, uh, you could point to it, they're recognizable, and you are a member of them, and the punishment for unrepentant, rebellious sin at its fullest extent is to disfellowship with that person. And so if there's no identifiable group, that act is impossible. Another uh, thing would be every time that it talks about a pastor or they call uh, or it's 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 referred to as a shepherd and a flock. There's an identifiable group of people that you are over, that you are shepherding, that you are protecting, that you are teaching. It's a, it's a group of people. Even if you want to make it as simple as to say the first time that the gospel message is preached at the day of Pentecost, and they, then they, they're able to identify, hey, there's 3,000 souls were added that day. There's I'm not saying that that was uh, what was actually a, you know, it wasn't First Baptist Church of Jerusalem, but they were counting the number of souls. There was somebody there that was able to say, look at all these people yeah. that have joined the body of Christ right here. Now, that would be like the body universal. We do know that people from all over the known uh, world at that time were gathering for Pentecost, but they knew that this many people, their souls were added this day. So they were pointing at them and saying, you're in, you're in, you're in, you're in. And then what we see on a local scale is baptism signifies that in the local church. This would be that people say, well, I don't understand about signing up on a membership covenant or whatever. And I personally have had problems with this. It, it, it was just that I would be able to say there's no membership covenant document that we sign in, in scripture. And then, but I'm looking here and I'm like, well, baptism is that in the new Testament. Yeah. It's the recognizable symbol. Here's the deal. It wasn't 20th, 21st century America where everybody knows about Jesus. We've all been a part of 15 different congregations over our lives. It's, it's something we do. It's a favorite pastime. It's fun. We've all been in and out of church. Ha <laughs> ha I leave here cause I don't like that music. And I go over here cause they do communion. And I, I wonder what the apostle Paul would say to the argument of the music was too loud at that church. Yeah, we, we do need an apostle. Here's the thing. Uh, I was going to say, we do need a letter from Apostle Paul, but we got a bunch of them right here. Oh! We got them for the church. All right. And, the, and the, the thing of it is, back then, if you were joining the church, that was first time. You didn't join another church yet. There was no church. This was the church. You were coming in, you were saying, hey, I'm rejecting all other gods. 
Uh, it meant something in society. Yeah. It wasn't like a cool thing. It was no, no. like if you, you got baptized, it was it wasn't like now where we where we when we're looking at trying to make somebody a member, we're having to track down and find out where you ever baptized or what you know, did that ever happen? And 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 if we're diligent about this, we're trying to find out uh do we actually believe that they're real believers, you know, whatever. Back then, that was first time. They were watching their lives. They watched them reject themselves, reject the world, turn to Christ, put their own lives at risk to do so. They dunked them in water. Everybody saw it and said, he's a member. That's it right there. We all identify with that. And it wasn't like this. Uh, I know. I know. I think we've talked about the baptism party thing. Um, you know, yeah. which, again, I'm, I'm just worried about Stone Chapel. I'm not here to sure. throw stones at other churches, but sure. There's no way that could have happened in the first century because when you were baptized, it was like a bullseye on your back for the Roman Empire to try to feed you to lions. Yep. Yep. Like you were giving up all social normity to you join were the church. Turned in. I mean, the, the scripture tells us, I think in Matthew 24, is it, where where uh, Jesus is talking about the destruction of the temple and stuff, and he said, your, mo- your mother, your brothers, your sisters, they're going to turn you over to the authorities for this. Yeah. Uh, so it, you weren't getting becoming a member of the church lightly. You were saying <laughs> Christ is worth me dying and I want everyone to know. And now we're like, oh, my son is getting baptized. We're going to invite all the cousins. We're going to grandma, make sure she can make it. We're going to hold off. We want everybody to see this now. OK, this is what we do. We get baptized on the river and then we never go to church again. Okay, <laughs> that's that's and that maybe that's the that, other well, thing. No, that that is absolutely, and it's evident in that often I'll ask someone like, "Where do you go to church?" and they'll tell me where they went to church as a child. Yeah, and I'm like, "Okay, cool. Where do you go to church at? <laughs> what body are you a part of?" Yeah. yeah, a lot of times they'll say, I'll even hear them say the phrase so inappropriately. Well, I'm a member of such and such church in Peoria, Kentucky. Well, we don't. You don't live there. We don't live there. What do you mean you're a member? Well, I joined there 36 years ago. Hadn't been there a day since. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm a member there. And it's like, well. That's where I was baptized. This is where you say, you keep saying this word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Let's talk about what a member is. Uh, we've read this scripture a bunch, and we'll keep reading it. Read it again. It's still good. It's so good. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, starting at verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members. And look, I, I recognize here that they're talking about members of a physical body, but it's obviously metaphorically talking about the church here. And all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, slaves, or free. And all were made to drink of one spirit. So this is, this is more talking about the church universal at this point. But then listen to this. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. So what it's doing right here is it's not not true of the church universal, but it's particularly true of the church local. Because if some, uh, if there's a foot out there in Afghanistan somewhere and he cuts himself off from the body, I don't know it. But if a foot in Stone Chapel cuts himself off from the body, all of a sudden Stone Chapel's limping. So it's talking about the the church local right here. Uh, And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, uh, that would not make any any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense in hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, one body one body and it goes on and kind of unpacks that even further but i I think about this like uh this would be a funny um experiment here what if you started stone chapel and every one of your members was dylan davis oh man we would just take the city by storm i was waiting for that absolute invasion would be the worst church in the world oh my god no but say say it of anybody if it was all ben it would be the worst church in the world if any in particular person it'd be just it's a church full of ears man or it's more than likely it's a church full of tongues and all they're doing is talking just talking 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 what body part do you think you are hmm somebody's got to be the butt ben I think I'm. I think I'm the hard head. That's the hard head. The forehead. Yeah, yeah. The frontal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, man. I, I don't know what I am. I, I I'm hard headed <laughs> for sure. Yeah, 
Uh, but any, but the the multiple parts of the body is also just for the correction. Okay, so you don't you don't uh, you know you don't walk into a a room backwards with your butt sticking out, obviously. And if your church is full of a bunch of butt heads, that's exactly what you do. So what you really <laughs> want to do is you want to have eyes and you want to have ears and you want to be able to see and know where you're going. And you need correction for these various things. Vision. You need vision. Ah, yeah. Where the people are. <laughs> do, 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 right. Pentecostal roots going in there. Um, yeah. Many parts, one body. I'm actually, speaking of many parts, one body, uh, I've in this uh, recent few, I'm in a, a class right now at, at school about church history, and I had to read that book you showed me a few months ago. Yeah. Julio, Justio. Who, Justo Gonzalez. Justo, yeah. The Story of Christianity. Recommend it for anybody. It's a great, good, good historical read. Little, little. Pretty easy to understand. It's a two-part book. Two-part book. There's a there's a book that takes it. On. Volume one yeah. is is Jesus to the to the Reformation, and the volume two is Reformation and now. Uh, but uh, I've just barely been appreciating an ecumenical view of the church, like a worldwide view of how big the body of Christ is. And so I, my uh, the pa- pastor Bobby in Florence, I consider him my pastor. Uh, he was always really good about building bridges, you know, with people that just are on different pages of doctrine than he is, and I always admired that because. You know, it's it's really easy for us to be like, you know, the this is the camp I'm in, and it's us four and no more kind of thing. And I watched him sit down with, you know, uh, cessationist Baptist, and also sit down with, you know, wild charismatic Pentecostals, and and bridge him to those people, like create unity in in the church on the things they do agree on. I always thought that was really cool. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go Friday. Um, I don't I don't know if I should say this on the podcast. I don't know if it's an open invite or not. I'm going to go pray with some Presbyterians at the City Hall in Goodlettsville. Oh, well, you oh should yeah. Come. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brooks and all yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think they they pray, they sing some hymns and do all kinds I of love, stuff. I love I love how how diverse yeah, the body is and I think often one of the reasons people get upset about church and they forsake their membership is because it's a diverse church and it's like this isn't what church is supposed to look like and it's like no this is just not what you look like right but you're a part of this you yeah. have you have a need to be connected to this body so you receive life to do your function in the body I think a lot of us too that we want it to be more of a monolith because it's more comfortable when we all 100% agree the the moment that there's somebody that's like well what about this what about this we would rather them just be quiet or go away or just conform and they might be wrong but the question whatever they're raising could also be valid for the sake of well what about this yeah. do you have an explanation can you help me <clears throat> understand and mo- a lot of times the reason people don't like to submit to any sort of church leadership is because their experience, unfortunately, has been when they ask a question, they get told they're being divisive or they're, <laughs> uh, they're trying to sow dissension or, or, or whatever. Sit down, shut up, don't, don't, don't you say anything. Or, and, and that it's unfortunate when, when it should be met with grace and gentleness and, okay, let's look at Scripture. Let's see what the Bible actually has to say about this. Um, and honestly, as difficult as it is to be able to say, Hey, I might be wrong. Let let me let me look into this more. Um, I think w- when you have many parts, you know there are going to be things that are more important to an ear than they are to an eye as well. S- no pun intended, but something that an eye can't see. And Ooh. so, so, but it's because it's over here, and and so the ear can bring some attention, and the eye might might not have even looked into that so much, and and so it brings attention, and this whole thing. I believe is just is is God uniting and bringing together the body in a way that they can function in in more of an uh, a singularity of thought. But that singularity is not one man; it's it's Christ, yeah. and he as he is sanctifying his church and 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 uh, presenting the bride as as blameless before the Father. This whole process for us this side of eternity is going to be uncomfortable. Uh, because we have to lay aside certain grievances or certain things that are un- that are uncomfortable for us personally for the benefit of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, I was going to end with this, but it just fits so well right Go here. Go for it. Then we will know Ephesians 4 verse 14 through 16. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love We will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Amen. I love it. 
I love it. Uh, yeah, I think that that's, you know, that's another church uh, body uh, metaphor comparison right there. Christ is the head. Uh, church membership, I believe, is implied by the way Scripture instructs elders to keep watch over those in their care. It's also implied by the metaphor of the body, as we just discussed. It's implied by the requirement to submit to church leadership, and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's implied, I might have said applied, I meant implied, by the fact that excommunication exists. It's implied by the way the church is supposed to discipline its members. Now, here's an interesting thing. So, Matthew 18 is where we get kind of our, our uh, kind of go-to introduction, you got it right there, of discipline. If your brother sins... So, so this is like a this is a great passage because it's like a step by step. Man, we don't get these all the time in scripture. There's a lot of scriptures that we debate over what was he trying to say right here. And then there's these scriptures where it's bullet point lists. Hey, do exactly this. And those are just I, those are gifts from God when that happens because it just removes the the nuance, okay? And it just takes it straight down. Nuance is I joke about this. Nuance is like a podcast word. It's like when you don't want to take a stance one one way or the other, you throw out the word nuance and all of a sudden you're a genius for sitting on the fence. So <laughs> so there's no nuance here. He says if your brother sins. All right. Now in, in this context, brother I believe is Christian. That that's what yeah. it's referring to. So this isn't just um you know if if some person down the road sins you need to go to him <laughs> it's just, i'm not saying that it's that you rule out going to him but you'll see by the end of this that a brother it, that, that that doesn't make sense okay? a brother okay yeah if dylan sins go and show him his fault in private this is important because i actually think that we usually put one step right in front of this one there's there's one crucial step that we like to throw right in front of that first step and and it would read like this if we wrote this scripture if your brother sins go to your sister and your friend and everyone else around you and talk about it and bash him in secret that's what we do naturally. That's what the flesh wants to do. We want to go ahead and, and assemble our army to all go, yeah, that Dylan is a loser. I can't believe he did that <laughs> to you. And they would be like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, of course. They would naturally just go, no, nah, he wouldn't do that. I know him. <laughs> on that subject, on the on the issue of gossip, I should say this too. The, the people that like to say that they don't, they're not gossips are usually, if you, I just want to point out for a second, side sidestep in this scripture. If you have ears for gossip, you are a gossip. Oh, that's 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 the thing that you need to remember. If you're the person sitting there listening and soaking it up, you're a gossip. You're not free of that accusation. You are a gossip. All right. If your brother sins, this is step one. Go to him as fault in private. Show, sorry, show him his fault in private. I misread that. If you if your brother sins, go to him and show him his fault in private. Okay, so one on one. Hey man, you did this. First, the first thing you're doing here is you're giving him an opportunity to explain himself. You might have misunderstood it, okay? But the implication here is, okay, he did sin. So you go to him, and it says, if he listens, you have won your brother. This is your goal. It's already telling you right out of the gate. Your goal is to win your brother. Your goal is not to hurt his feelings or to make him mad or to get to say your piece. Your goal is to win your brother. So it says this first step. He doesn't do that. He does not listen to you. Take one or two more with you. All right. The implication here is we're talking about a brother. So one or two more brothers with you. So we got now we're talking about these are people that are members of the church, recognizable members of the church, not people that have been showing up for a couple of weeks or or dropped in that we don't know whether they're believers or not. We haven't seen any sort of pattern of fruit in their life. We're talking about people that have some sort of weight into this body. They're people you can trust. Yeah. They're brothers. Okay. Take two or more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, and this is hearkening back to Deuteronomy, I believe. Is that correct? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's Deuteronomy. Uh, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. We'll check that. If he refuses to listen to them, step three. Which, can we pause here just for a yep. second? Yep. If, if somebody comes to you in private, and you're like, get out of here. I'm not listening to you. You don't say that to me. Then, <laughs> And they come back with two more of your brothers, like, just take a deep breath for a second and listen a little deeper this yeah, time. Yeah. Actually, I think if that happens, you probably will. I My contention yeah. is that that almost never happens. Sure. It, it's obviously we gossip first, naturally, but but we will sometimes go to the person directly and, and 
air the grievance, talk about it. Yeah. But almost never will we then go get two or three brothers yeah. and come back. I don't know why, but it's almost like that'll never work. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing yeah. I'd rather just keep talking about them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, I would agree. I think that actually would, would place tremendous weight on the first person. It's, it's a whole intention. Yeah. Hey man, how you could, it's, it's like an intervention really. Yeah. It's like, Hey, Hey, okay. May, whoa, hold on. I respect all of you guys. What have I done? Well, yeah. Maybe I have done something wrong here. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and also at this point in time, maybe, maybe somebody you like, if, if I, if I'm acting like an idiot and Ben goes and gets two more of my brothers, you know, Corey and Christian. Okay. And these three guys come to me to share my sins with me a second time. You know, I already know Corey's going to say it to me differently than Ben will. That, 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 you know, group effort there may be beneficial in the diversity of the body, the different members being able to um, give insight and perspective in a, in a fresh way. Right. So I think that that is another testament to the scripture you read in first Corinthians about there's many parts of this body. Right. And also, again, the the implication that there is a group of identifiable people, a, a membership of people. If I have a problem with Dylan and I want to go to him, and so I go get my neighbor and I go get some guy that I work with, and we come to Dylan and we start telling him he's wrong, Dylan's going to go, I don't know this guy. Who's he? <laughs> To yeah. tell me anything about that, I don't even know if he's a Christian. I'm not gonna listen to him. And I, I, I obviously, you know, if somebody joins the church, they're a part of the church. I would also tread lightly here with, and if if it's a, if 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 it's a mature believer that has sinned, someone like myself, very mature person, you mm, know, naturally, yep, yeah. I I would just be cautious of bringing in a new believer as part of the posse. I'm gonna go ahead and say, don't do that, just for the same reason that the. One of the requirements of an elder is that they're not a new believer. I think it's it's basically acknowledging right there, hey man, that guy's got some instruction yet to yeah. be done <laughs> before he's equipped to be working in this type of yeah. role. Also, uh, again, I'm not trying to cast shade on large churches. I, I know of many large churches that are wonderful, but if if you go to a mega church uh, and you bring a couple members, it, you could very easily basically effectively be doing the same thing. I don't know who these people are. I have no relationship with them. Some goofball that you got that's in a community group down the road that I don't know anything about. That agrees with you. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. When they become a member, they go here, you're saying? I, I don't recognize this. So <laughs> obviously, I think the implication here brothers. is... Brothers. Right. They're brothers. They're people that you recognize as, I, I, I should listen to them. I should pay attention and, and though it doesn't spell it out here, I think it's because they knew they were small groups of people at this time. Everybody was going to know this is a brother. Okay. This isn't my brother that I didn't know I had until I looked on ancestry.com and it turns out neighbor down the street, something happened there. Yeah. And <laughs> it's not that. Okay. It is, this is your brother in Christ. You know it. That's step two. It almost never happens. Okay. That's a shame. If he refuses to them, tell it to the church. Okay. This is interesting to him. Interesting, sorry. Interesting to me that he says, tell it to the church. He doesn't say, tell it to the elders. Now, I'm not saying that it's wrong to tell it to the elders. I am saying, I don't want to say what the Bible doesn't say. So if I'm going to make it a rule that telling it to the church just simply means telling it to the elders, I think that I can make a good case here that number one, uh, it's acceptable to take it to the body of believers. And number two, that means your body of believers better be an actual biblical body of believers and not a bunch of goofballs that you just had to fill out a paper on their way out the door saying they're members. Think about this for a second. You go and you got a grievance. Do you want some know-nothing dummy that's been sitting in the back row for six weeks, but he signed a membership card speaking into this situation. I'm going to say, hold on a second. I, I don't think that's proper representation into this situation. I don't yeah. know him. I don't trust him. The, the understanding here is that this body is a strong unit of believers submitted not only to the leadership of the church, but to each other as the church submits to Christ as the head. That's why this works. It's like you bring them before him. This is irrefutable. Yeah. You, if, you, if you don't repent after these people are able to speak into this situation, then comes the final step. Uh, do you have anything you want to... I would just... I, I agree. The Bible does not uh, say church leadership. It does just say the church. Right. I would say in, in modern context, uh, as, as a pastor, I want to know when I have a sheep that is at this state. So right. it's not necessarily an issue of like, I'm going to go tell 
I'm telling you know my, my kids love to come tattle. Right. I I can't stand it. I almost want to punish them for tattling for the thing they're tattling on. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I also it ter- terrible illustration. Anyways, uh, <laughs> if if someone in Stone Chapel is sinning to the point that a brother's gone to them, three brothers have gone to them, and now it's time for the church to know something or you know what whatever that context is. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to know about it so I can talk to this person. Right, right. And I, I, and I think this is addressed by Paul uh, yeah. in, in particular. So we can we can actually, let's just pick one. Um, let's go, let's do that one actually. Okay, so uh, in 1 Corinthians, I think. Five. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, 1 Corinthians 5, okay. Um, can I have mine? Yeah, go for it. Uh, do you want to read this one? Go for it. If you're already there, go. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. This is a bad one. <laughs> for a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit and as and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Hang on to that word. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. You do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Sorry, that's in question form. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I'm, I'm going to keep reading here for a Please. second. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexual immorally of the world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters, since you would need to go out of the world. So again, he's talking about the church in particular right here. He's like, of course, the world is full of those people. And where are you going to go? I mean, we're going to hide. You're you're in the world. OK, yeah. But he's saying as far as your church, your brothers and sisters, these are not brothers and sisters. They ought not be treated as brothers and sisters. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. I, look at that. There it is. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, rev, uh, reveler, rev, reviler, I don't know how to pronounce yeah. that, drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Outside of what? The church. The church. Outside. There it is. Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. But Ben, we're not supposed to judge each other. <laughs> so again, we already know church discipline's implied. Uh, sorry, church discipline implies church membership. Point back to Matthew 18 for that. Excommunication isn't even possible if there is no identifiable or definable group to belong to. So Paul's talking about a particular just nasty sin. And he's going, what are you doing? <laughs> Why is he still here? Why are you letting this go on? How often in our churches do we just let disgusting the, sin go on? Because we don't want to address it. The little leaven. It, yeah. It, it messes up the whole lump of dough. Right. And I, we have so tolerated things in the name of a false doctrine of grace. Yeah. That we have brought in wickedness into our gatherings in, in the name of... I want more people in this congregation. Ooh, we, uh-oh, uh-oh. We're, we are willing to have... No, he did I'm saying it. We are willing to have more people in the room that are actively living a sinful life. I'm not talking about when an unbeliever stumbles in looking to hear the gospel. I'm talking about people that have been in church and they're living in sin. They're not changing. They're not growing. They are openly embracing sinful lifestyles and they're justifying it. And we, we have allowed them to sit in the seats of our congregations in the name of we don't, you know, Jesus didn't turn anybody away. Yes, he did. He absolutely did. Yes, he will. Read the whole New Testament. Get to Revelation. Read about that, Jesus. Mm. We have to protect this gathering. And I, I think church membership and church discipline, the topic we're talking about right now, it is necessary for a healthy church to be spotless and blameless. Okay. And I also think that on that, the obviously the implication is the word of the day here. Okay. The implication of that, protect the church because there is such a thing as church discipline. If you're going to bring your brother to 
to the church for the this third next to final step in church discipline, you need a church that has been protected, is doctrinally sound, people that can be trusted to speak the truth of the word of God. If you allow disgusting sin to permeate throughout the culture of your church, these people are not fit to speak into any sort of church discipline. And of course your church is poisoned. And of course you're going to have a lot of people that are going to have stories about how spiritual abuse and this, that, and whatever, because you're an unhealthy gathering of believers. And the, the, the real sad part about it is most of the time, the beginning of that poison entering your church is um, you've got it twisted in your head that it's just you trying to be kind or trying to be nice as if the gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of how to be nice to everybody. And and that's what you're trying to foster in your church is let's not hurt anybody's feelings. Let's not offend anybody. We've been th- through some difficult conversations in, in our church. It's not, it's never going to end. Okay. Right. There, the instructions are necessary because you're going to keep encountering this. We're sinful fallen people. We need correction. Okay. If you're just going to find a group of people that thinks you're just the smartest person in the world. Well, I got news for you. You'd never know if you weren't. Yeah. No one's going to help you. And, and I would say that that's the equivalent of hating my brother. If I'm not willing to speak into a bad situation in their life. Because again, the goal here is to win your brother. Even when it says, hand them over, he says, hand them over for the destruction of the flesh. He's acknowledging because right now he's indulging in the flesh. He's being led by the flesh. We want that flesh to be destroyed. So if he won't take the instruction, it would be to his detriment that we allowed him to continue to fellowship. Because even as he poisons us, he remains deceived. So we want his spirit to be saved in the day of the Lord. So yeah. he needs to be turned over so his flesh can be destroyed. And there are, uh, it juries out here, so I'm not I'm not saying this is fact, but there are a handful of theologians that believe that in 2 Corinthians 2, Paul is addressing this same situation of, of this oh, yeah. sexually immoral man. He wrote in 2.1, But I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote you, so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you all that my joy would be the joy of you all. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. Mm -hmm. so that on the contrary you should rather forgive and comfort him otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow wherefore i urge you to reaffirm your love for him for to this end also i wrote so that i might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things yeah, so I think also the idea that, that that Paul is trying to say here in the church is that this church is supposed to be this this organism where Christ is the head, and it, and I'm not trying to suggest that you sidestep the eldership and hold a big uh, meeting in the middle of a church service. We have order for a reason, so obviously you need to go to the elders. But I but I am saying that if you've already gone with two or three brothers, then just simply going to the elders and and calling that going to the church, there's a discrepancy here. You ought to have a strong body that you can call the church that is involved in this final step. This should really I don't believe you should have a group of elders that are dis uh, dis fellowship with a believer without the church being involved because what does the church now all of a sudden has no idea what's going on this guy we're not allowed to even have lunch with him anymore we're told not to have lunch with a person i don't know what he did because there was a secret back room meeting somewhere where he was told gone get and as far as i'm concerned that was my brother so what's going on so there needs to be i don't know what this needs to look i'm not i'm not advocating for a one-size-fits-all model for all these churches so i don't have answers to that either unfortunately probably should but i don't but i do uh there was a there was a situation in our church about a year ago that uh, we did not disfellowship with somebody, but there was uh, the there were some there were some elder families involved in this. Is the only reason they were involved so early, but there was an issue with one of our members, and so we sat down and 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 opened the scripture and said, "Hey, this is where you've erred. Um, you you know you need to you need to change these things. Here's what we're going to do moving forward." Uh, and this person just slowly slept slipped away, and uh, we never. We never told anyone kind of what had happened because yeah. didn't didn't know kind of what that looked like. It was a weird situation, right? But I will say that that 
specific situation I'm talking about has caused a lot of damage inside right. our church. Yeah. And so I, I actually think that uh, the the lack of transparency, of course, you know, I want to I will gladly openly condemn a lack of transparency with issues like what's happening at IHOP or I saw recently at the Frontier Alliance International. That guy, he he messed up sexually and morally in a <laughs> catastrophic way, man. Come on, man. Uh, and so I, I will absolutely condemn a lack of transparency there. Now, that I will say uh, f- for Frontier Alliance International, FAI, they put out a very transparent letter detailing the offenses and the sins and their decision they made. And I thought they were transparent. So right. Kudos okay, to good. them for that part of things, but there's been so many uh, church leaders that have have had s- serious sexual immoral failures, or well, let's just say immoral. Let's yeah. whatever, right. just immoral failures, and a, a lack of transparency has it, it. Good intentions are like the enemy of the church. With right. good intentions. Uh, these these church leaders have tried to cover up, and they always cite Noah. You know, you got to cover the the, na- the nakedness, and it's like, well, let's. <laughs> That's not really what that's talking about. That's not talking about not telling the church body whenever someone has has sinned. And, and because it's been so not transparent, so covered up, it has caused so much more damage than if this bad thing that happened, if we would just take it into the light right, and let it be dealt with. Yeah, I mean, let's just face it again. Uh, it, it, kind of what we were discussing with all these things coming to light with uh, especially a lot of these large celebrity type culture churches. Look, man trying to protect in secret these sins that are being committed it ain't doing the church any favors and it's gonna be exposed it's gonna come out yeah and and uh, look it is difficult we're a new church we're we are still learning this in real time <laughs> yeah we're reading it he read something then just a second ago about the majority and i really forgot that I even said that there I, i'm learning in real time some of these things and i think the concept is you know how we were talking about at the the very early church you know um they would have these meetings, and we just know this from history Love books. Love feasts. <laughs> uh, yeah. We know this from history books. We know this from first century historians. This, some of this is in um, extra biblical texts, but it's, you know, the Didache and whatnot. It's explaining kind of how they did their services. And, of course, they centered it around the Lord's table. And when it got to that portion, though there were unbelievers that were present to be to, to learn, to be instructed, when it got to that portion, there was this sort of... This has nothing to do with the fence. It's just a, hey, you can't do this. Go, go on, get out here. Uh, we're going to do this now. Okay. I, I think likewise, that's actually a, a pretty good picture of how the church-wide portion of discipline should should happen. I'm not going to have somebody that's been sort of attending from time to time that should be involved in this final step of church discipline. It doesn't make any sense. They don't have any skin in this right. game. They're not a recognized, baptized believer in Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they're not mature in their faith. This this is somebody that should not be speaking into it. And it should be, hey, y'all step out. We got to handle and this some is business. just basic. Uh, this is like basic. If we just look at the let's let's boil the church down to one of the allegories we see it in Scripture of, of a flock of sheep. Mm. Okay, if if we are all sheep and the the Lord is the good shepherd, uh, and 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 I get really sick. It is a good thing for the shepherd to separate me from the rest of the flock, so that I don't make everyone else sick and the flock dies. Yeah, spiritually, and so yeah. it, this is not like a. Uh, of course, this is reprimand, and of course, it is discipline, and we're using those words. It is. This is a this is a, a a enormous act of love to call somebody out to and I'm I'm not talking about from a prideful position like I'm calling you out but like hey this is what the Bible says you are in danger of eternal peril you are in danger of eternal consequences and I love you too much to not say something to you about it yeah and and then the real question kind of gets down to do you the opposite side of that is do you love yourself too much to make things uncomfortable. For the benefit of the church, because I do think that that is the sickness that's in the modern, I'm just going to call it the American church, is I love myself too much to address it. And we see it on both sides. We see church leadership and church members who, though something might be needing to be addressed, it's just too uncomfortable. And they know that it's just going to go bad if I even bring it up. So I'm not going to deal with it. And so they let the poison stay in the church or they have the the person who has created the problem rather than even even allowing themselves to submit to any of the processes of discipline they just hightail it out of there they go to a church down the street now poison is in that church so this is a further step where i actually think the 
elders of that of the first church should reach out to the second church and let them know what's going on. We're having a council. Yeah. And and the second church, you ought not receive somebody that's in the middle of a church discipline process. I'm just going to say that. Yeah. I don't think you should because we are part of the universal body of church, uh, of Christ. And though it might be discipline and we don't know what the deal is, find out what the details are. Find out if they're <laughs> biblical. Okay. You said this recently and it made me totally rethink our new members process. <laughs> I'm in the process right now of fixing everything. Where did where did where did yeah. you come from? <laughs> And uh, why did you leave there? You know, when you when you uh, apply for a job and they want character references, why does the church not think that's important? <laughs> okay? You want to join the church? I want some character references. I want to call your church in Peoria, yeah. Kentucky, and him. I want to hear him say, he hasn't been here in 28 years. Yeah. I, it always grieves me when I'm at a funeral and the, the preacher's standing up there, and it's like... I. It, it, anytime the preacher at the funeral says, I didn't know this person, they have to give that qualification before they preach. Right. It always grieves my heart. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, man, please, God, have saved this person. Yep, yep. And, you know, and honestly, when you're talking about, uh, you know, shepherding a flock, I heard somebody the other day say uh, something. They said a shepherd needs to smell like sheep. And in a lot of these churches, the people that you're calling pastor, they're not they're not pastors in, in any real sense of the original intention of that word. They don't smell like sheep. They're inoculated from the whole flock and, and they're they're off kind of doing their own thing. They're sitting up high, comparing themselves to old testament prophets and you know i'm the man of god and and you know we know that we look at the old Testament, we look at moses we look at david and and he's he, they are to point us to jesus okay they're not to, yeah. they're not to point us to dylan davis right dylan davis is our moses that gives me a uh, memory that i've recently been really into like duke cannon soaps this reminded you of duke I cannon I, you talk about smelling like sheep and i was like i understand the metaphor i don't actually want to smell you bad you don't really though. want to smell like sheep and duke cannon has that listen if you got yes some of their marketing is a little bit colorful okay i'm not <laughs> <laughs> you always gotta say i don't fully endorse uh, well I, i'll endorse all of their soap scents <laughs> i just maybe not some of their marketing ploys right. but uh they've got uh one right now called midnight swim oh and uh, and one of them, I, I originally bought it because they are like very pro patriotic, and I love America. And yep. also, the bar of soap is huge, so like <laughs> it's I, just a block. I like to really soap up, okay? Yeah. And I don't casually shower. I'm I'm in there. I'm 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 cleaning, yep. okay? I'm yep. I am achieving a task here. You're exfoliating. I'm using the soap. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And so I, I you're need, coming out there a little bit raw. A few layers I are need, gone. I need more than a normal little bitty bar, yeah. okay? So they got a an oversized bar of soap. I like that, but they have uh, one that is uh, smells like naval diplomacy. <laughs> I've had it. <laughs> or supremacy or something. It's good. Because, you know, our, we're better than everyone else. That's right. And so that, but anyways, Supreme. I want to, I want to be with the sheep, but I think I want, I want all the sheep to smell like naval supremacy. I want right. all the sheep to smell like Duke Cannon soap. Okay, I agree with that. Clean yourselves off. Okay, well, we're gonna do, we're gonna do the best we can spiritually. And instruct you. Actually, uh, we have mouthwash in our bathrooms at our church. That was like day one stuff Use too. It. He was like, when I when I <laughs> when he got us this new building, he was like, I'm gonna put mouthwash in here. People are gonna feel like they're really a part of something. <laughs> And then all that really happened was the kids were squirting it on the walls. So, oh, yeah. First thing that happened, he lit a candle in there too. Like, Light a candle. Lit a candle, and and we had a guy going to our church at the time who was the fire chief, and he immediately went out there and blew the He's candle like, out. <laughs> <laughs> don't let Satan it out. I'm but, let yeah, it I mean, and, and, and when I heard the thing about the sheep, smelling like the sheep, the thing, I, I appreciated it because, and I think it's, you know, there there are parts of this world that that phrase right there, it, they would have been confused by it because they're like, of course, I mean, my, my pastor is, is, is deeply involved with it. But in the United States, that has gotten a little far away from the role of pastor that uh, you kind of touched on at the very beginning, but it's gotten to a point where church leadership is getting elevated and elevated to this almost celebrity, even within the small pond, big fish, small pond kind of deal. I'm a big deal. And anybody is susceptible to this. If you feed that problem, it's just, we're all full of pride. We are prideful people. And, and they, they like to use the phrase "don't don't touch God's anointed." Oh, right, right. And n- numbers eleven, and I th- I do think there is a, a lesson to be taken away in honor of this. But in Numbers eleven, Mary and Amer- Miriam and Aaron and Aaron <laughs> are outside the tent, and they are critis- They're they're gossiping to each other about how Moses has married a Cushite woman. Yep. And the Lord corrects them outside the tent, which I think we need. You know, that was a big deal in the Old Testament. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And he says to them, why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? Mm -hmm. And we have always applied that to church leadership. And I agree Moses is to be pointed to God. I also, you know, what, like I, I, 
it it tastes bad every time I accidentally say Bobby. I, right. And that that's just a cultural thing. I'm not advocating that you have to say pastor to anyone. Yeah. But for me, like I I desire to honor the man that I consider my pastor. So like it it that just tastes bad to me. Um, so I do think there's like it, even in the New Testament we see scriptures about honoring the you know the the man honoring the the elders of the church, um, and in the same breath like in that in in the name of honor don't put them in a position to fall like they're they're just man they're, there's no mediator between you and God just Jesus like there's there's no one that is is elevated spiritually. Uh, in, in in this hierarchical rank of heaven, it's just Jesus is is we're all right. bowing down before him. Yeah, I guess I, I part of me too is like I don't know anybody who who starts out any sort of church movement and says something like honor the man of God with any sort of bad intention. I mean, that what they're trying to do is honor God, and that yeah. this man is, is the man who's been uh, lifted up. Uh, Conceivably, as we believe the scripture says, that he has been called by God to be the shepherd or to to be an elder of, and a teacher. We we believe that God is the one we're honoring by honoring this person. I but I do think that what naturally happens is ungodly people will behave in ungodly yeah. ways whenever given the opportunity, and so you you can very easily without naming any names. Every one of us can point to five pastors that we know of online. All right, so we got... <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can name them right now that we're saying, that is inappropriate. That's an abuse. Whatever. Stone Chapel Jet Skis. <laughs> and I'm not we're going taking up to a do it. Camp- okay. giving campaign because we need a houseboat to fish. Don't you do it. For men. Kenneth Nopeland. Kenneth, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways... Um, <laughs> What else can we say about this? I, I, I mean, I, I just feel like this is one of those things that is so obvious in Scripture that you need to be a member, and, and you need that means that it needs to be identifiable. I can point to you and say you belong to this body, and that part of that is so that you can be called to account when you step out of you know line with Scripture, and part of that so you can be a part of that process for somebody else when that's necessary. Yeah. If there's no membership, everybody's willy nilly flying in and out, and who knows if they actually. <laughs> you know, have any part in our fellowship, they just are here sometimes, then there's no ability for any correction like that. And also there's no respect whatsoever. So why, why would you listen to anybody? I, I wanted to read a couple scriptures. Sure. Uh, Galatians 6, 1 brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. So in our endeavor to do Matthew 18, uh, I should have looked up where this parable was but the speck in the log i should probably know that one by heart yeah you should yeah definitely should (laughs) (laughs) you know in in my endeavor if i'm about to confront ben on a sin that he's he's committed and i want to i want to win my brother back i want to first make sure that my heart is pure in this and that this is not a speck in a log because what this is not is every time your brother offends you it's when they have sinned when they have sinned against god uh this is not like you know every single Every single time you felt entitled to get your feelings hurt, you don't need to go gather in a posse to go confront somebody. Uh, this is check your check your own heart first, so that you can recognize you too are a flawed individual in need of a savior, and you can in humility go to your brother and with gentleness try to win him over. Because I, I I assure you, if you if you you know I uh, you know it, we love to say, can we have coffee? I never know if when someone asks to have coffee with me, I'm like, what is this about? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, if, if somebody asks you to have coffee, it's guaranteed it's uh, going to be a bad know. conversation. So, yeah. <laughs> they're trying to soften you, soften you with the Lord's elixir. They're, they're like, as long as I got a warm cup of java in his hands. Coffee? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, it, we, can, I, can I have coffee with you? And then you sit down and it's like you're you, immediately you're being berated. Uh, you're not going to win your brother back that way uh, yeah. there there is a there there are so many scriptures here that our heart make sure that you have gone before you have tested yourself against scripture first i love that psalm uh that that the uh search me and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting like go you approach matthew 18 that process in the endeavor of seeking jesus right 
and and I believe that God will bless that process where two or three are gathered. There am I in the midst of them. That's that's much more part of that church discipline passage than that is what it is. And all the same, you know, I I think that all of this dovetails into forgiveness, which also one of our early podcasts was on this subject. But there are many of you who have you all, you've left a church, and the only thing in your mind is how much that church hurt you, and the only thing in that church's mind is how much you hurt them, and you are so talking past each other. And there's a wonderful, beautiful opportunity the Lord's got his hand out right there for reconciliation. And let me tell you, our God is a God of reconciliation. If nothing else, that is the, that's the big takeaway, man. He reconciles us to him. We should recognize, reconcile with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should do this. So humble yourselves. Don't try to recently, you know, ran into a situation where somebody tried to act like nothing was wrong. Like nothing ever happened. You know what that is? That's lying. That's deceptive. <laughs> and maybe you don't feel like you're you're verbally telling a lie, but when you paint a smile on your face after you know that you just you you've actively got a dagger in your brother's belly, you're stabbing him. E2 brute. Okay, you need what you need to do is say, <laughs> let me pull this knife out real quick. Sorry about that. <laughs> I recognize what I did there. Let me put this away. Okay? <laughs> Have a moment to to forgive, and you need to humble yourself to make that possible. I did want to just touch on this for a second. This seems like this is like a side issue, but in Titus, when it's talking about the qualification for elders, I'm gonna I'm gonna breeze through these real quick. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you uh, may put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, sorry, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant, quick tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to to give instruction of sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. All right, so there's there's a bunch more here, and and this a very similar list to this uh, is in First Timothy, I think, First or Second Timothy. Um, all I want to point out here is that somebody has to be involved in holding your elders to these standards, and if the church membership is not a recognized body of believers who can do this, who else is going to do it? Now, you may have a, a system of plurality of elders. I hope you do. But even then, the further safeguard against leadership running out of control is a recognized body of mature, godly believers who submit to one another and hold each other accountable. Now, this is not an authoritarian authority structure where it's like, uh, we're all in charge. It's, it's not like that. Let's recognize this. But even Jesus submitted to the Father. You know, even when we look in... Um, uh, when we look in Ephesians five and it, and it starts to talk about husbands and wives, it, it doesn't say they're not equal. It says it says husbands submit to your wives. It says uh, hu- I'm sorry, wives. Ooh, that almost went sideways. Wow, that's definitely wives, not what it says. Wives submit to your husbands. Heretic. I, forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for saying that. <laughs> wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her. We see this beautiful picture of what Christ did for the church, and that even though him. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are all co-equal, that he submitted to the will of the Father. So here's what we can do. When you want to submit to the Word of God, the the times where we get to see that actually happening is where it's something you don't really want to do, yeah. but you do it anyway. That's, what, that's when submission actually peeks through everything else, is when it's something you don't want to do, but you do it anyway, because this Word is true, we trust it, we believe in it, we believe that it's faithful, and we submit to it, especially when we don't really love what it has to say. I don't know where else to go from here. Church membership. Church membership. So did you have any like closing thoughts on it or did, is that kind of what you already did? I, I would just say that uh, I, I I just want to once again, not not to, you know, uh, beat a dead horse here. Yeah. But beat the dead horse. <laughs> He's we, dead. He there can't are feel it. instructions over and over again. Um, and go, go read this for yourself. Titus chapter three uh, talks about having nothing to do with divisive people. Uh, James chapter five talks about uh, to 
to turn a person back that has wandered from the truth. Uh, Romans 16, uh, Paul is urging the church in Rome uh, to watch out for those who cause divisions among you. Second um, Thessalonians 3 is, is actually warning us about associating with lazy men that don't support their houses. Hey, that'll preach. That's, and, and, and listen. That's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, and so all all of these, there's so many issues: divisiveness, uh, laziness, or idleness, as 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 Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica. Um, there there are so many issues that Paul is like, "Hey, have nothing to do with the with these people." Again, as Ben said earlier, this is talking about judging inside the church, judging one another amongst brothers. If someone is professing Christ and not behaving as such, you as a believer have an obligation to you yourself. Go show them their sin in the scripture. You have an obligation to the health of the body to hold one another accountable. Uh, and, and we hate the word submission. Again, bringing up our, our Western context of it, of I don't want to submit to anybody. You know, we have we have a huge issue with authority. When you were talking about the fatherless homes, oh my goodness, I about shouted. Uh, but mm. Uh, mm. Mm. that's real. Uh, we, we have such a huge problem with submission. The life of a believer is one of submission, of I'm submitted first and foremost to God. I'm submitted to his His plan for my life. And, and I am submitted to the other members of my body. Let me, let we me, are submitted I, to one I another. I have to interrupt you for just a second because I just want to say if you <laughs> – I know the word submit really just – ooh. I want – you need to when, – when you get that feeling on your skin when somebody says the word submit, you need to know that that, that – that skin that's crawling, that's the devil massaging your back. Oh, my god! Okay? He's making you feel that way. Your old pastor didn't make you feel that this way. the creepiest thing you've ever said on this podcast. The devil's over there going, oh, yeah, there's a knot right here. Let me get that out of there. Oh, no. Listen. Listen to me. If you can't submit, listen, you will go to hell. Okay? That's... Point blank, if you cannot submit, you will go to hell. Now, I'm not saying you submit to ungodly authority, but do what the Bible says. Be a part of the process. Help your church be able to be the godly body that you can submit to. It's kind of like when we talk about husbands and wives, and and and, and a lot of times women are like, I can't submit to him. And it's like, well, you're, you're supposed to submit to him. He's supposed to you know, die like Jesus yeah. did. And, they, and they're like, okay, well, I'll wait on him to die. Well, the Bible didn't say do that. It said do your part. Yeah. It didn't give you the the option to say, well, he's not leading my house right, so I'm not going to submit to him. It, just, it didn't say that. It I, actually addresses that. I think first or second Peter does. He, right. He talks about the wife of an unbeliever. Yeah, yeah. It would be it would be awesome for us if God put that in there for us, a little caveat so you didn't have to. But man, he just made it a little too sticky. If he was like, accept America, because I know this is countercultural <laughs> to feminism, you guys don't have to listen to this part. Okay, I'm and I'm trying to say that when it comes to the church and all of that, be a part of the solution. Don't disfellowship yourself. Don't run away so you can find another wimpy group of believers so y'all can be completely ineffective together and <laughs> devils over there massaging all your shoulders. Okay? Don't that's a that needs to be the picture on the Please front of this episode. Stop using that allegory. <laughs> it hurts my insides. Uh, anyways. James okay. five nineteen, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. Yeah. It's time for the church to clean up the roles. That's what I think. I, I think it's time. Right? How many people have you just, you got to sign a commitment card and you're like, I actually, I don't know, squat about yeah. them. Re and redefine what being nice means. Right. This is in, uh, this is in second Thessalonians chapter three, uh, I'm going to read this whole passage here. Chapter 3, verse 6 through 15. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. It's talking about freeloaders. <laughs> On the contrary, we worked night and day laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this, not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people are... Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. 
And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in this letter. Do not look at this is right here. I'm about to eat some people up. Do it. Do not associate with them in order so that in order that they may feel ashamed. Oh, bring in shame back. Yet Thank you, do Lord. Do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as you would a fellow believer. I'm so sick of hearing believers say, Jesus is not about shame. Man, you know what? You do something shameful. Be ashamed. I hope you feel ashamed. <laughs> Just tell them right there. You should be ashamed. I dropped my ladder. I would have been strand. That would have been shameful to have to have called Ben and been like, man, I, I dropped my ladder off this roof. Aren't you embarrassed? <laughs> be ashamed. <laughs> For the glory of God, be ashamed. For the glory- I hope you're ashamed. I, I Think about this. Like every Sunday we come together, not just Sundays, but we come together as believers. I mean, essentially not to over like dramatize this, but we're going to war against the things of this world. Oh. We're going to war against the devil and his tactics no more devil massages who do you want (laughs) beside you while you're going to war you want another warrior you want somebody that when when you get hit and you're down you want somebody who's going to grab your collar and pull you to safety or going to put you on their shoulders and carry you (laughs) there (laughs) (laughs) so we don't we this is the, the whole idea is we got because we're we're too timid about church discipline and we're too frivolous with church. We're handing out church membership cards just left and right. I'm print off more of them. Give them away. I just wanted many people in these seats. You're weakening the church. You're yeah. not equipped for war. Oh you, my you can't God. go. You're not going. Okay. <laughs> We're getting steamrolled by the devil. <laughs> oh no! Because our churches aren't equipped for war. Man, I was gonna just gonna preach. Oh my goodness! This oh. would be a great. Uh, a lot of these podcasters they do like little two minute clips on their Instagram reels. Oh yeah, then maybe we should do this that. This would be a good one. Yeah, I like whenever the pastor says something that's just like it's it's like uh, it's articulate, but it's not very profound. Yeah. And there are other. <laughs> this is like every single. I got what it is. They're like, wow. <laughs> You know, it's I not even that day. good. I hope I I hope this doesn't get back to whoever this was. Say but it. It was a little. It was like a little live video. Okay. And. <laughs> All right. So so back. far, it's someone we know. It's get back. To I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe I'll cut it out. I don't know. Oh no! Don't a, do that. It was a husband and wife, and and they just started the. Um, the home live video and waiting people to get on. And, and the husband said, um, so we're sitting in our bonus room and the wife goes, "Mm." (laughs) (laughs) I was like, you bet you're so used to going "Mm," that you don't even know Mm. what you're saying "Mm," to anymore. One time, (laughs) you know, my, my dad was not into, we're in the bonus room, the games and his his man was into order in his ministry. You know what I'm saying? Yep. You know, there wasn't any chaos happening, really. It was, you sit down, be quiet, and listen to me talk. He told me that whenever he was an evangelist, he was preaching in this church, and there was some lady that just kept going, amen, every, like, two minutes, right? <laughs> like, just stuff. I he know was that was getting telling a awful story from prison about rape. Yeah. And this woman said, amen. And he, from the stage, said, stop doing that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah we, get in, we get in these ruts where we're just like, these are... What's a, what's it's like an automatic response. It's, we're just triggered to do it for no good reason, and I, I'm just like, hey, you've removed all the value of it. Like, yeah. I, it means nothing for for me now when I hear you say, "Wow, Amen, Yeah," mm, because you do I like it, it though. You do it for nothing. I like the feedback. <laughs> Our church is quiet. We got a quiet church. I got like do. Nick and sometimes Robin. Yeah, Robin. Will, and, Robin will give feedback. Yeah, and sometimes if it if it's too quiet, if neither of them say anything, oh my god, that was a bad sermon. All right, if I get vocal, you're going to know it. I'm afraid if you get vocal, you'll be like, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been holding it back. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, sincerely, our hearts, though, are, uh, you know, we're joking around. Um, my heart for the church universal is that you get plugged into a local church, one that can hold you accountable, that can hurt you when necessary. Uh, and, and that just means it's necessary for your soul and it's necessary for the health of the church. And there's a reason why the elders are held, the teachers, that not many of you are called to be teachers, because you're held to a, a really high standard and you're, you're held accountable. And this word is the measuring rod. We look at this, we take it very seriously. And so I just, I would imp- implore you, if you're not a member of a church, 
first thing is just to ask yourself why. What what is it that's stopping you? And and if it, if you're saying, well, this is not a church that I can submit to, then you need to ask why that is. Yeah. They might not be doctrinally sound, and then if that's the case, quit playing patty cake with them. Go somewhere that is. Yeah. But if they are doctrinally sound and you just don't like there being any accountability, the problem is you. And and you need to get you need to get that squared away, and and that's going to require your your flesh kind of getting yeah, pulled. The out greatest away. thing you can do is is if you left for a wrong reason that wasn't morality or doctrine, mm-hmm. you need to go back to that church you left. Go reconcile. You need to go back right. to that place. Don't don't. I'm going to start fresh. Yeah. You don't get to do that. Go back. Yeah. Yeah, we've had people, and, and I'm I'm just the worship leader at the church, so it's I'm I'm not the one making all the phone calls, doing all this kind of stuff. But I have had people that were close to me at the, at the church that have left that I just you know it's just like this is ridiculous. You know, try to call them, try to text them, reach out, you know, please let's talk. You know, help me understand. You just left without a word or whatever, and it's it's very difficult to convince anyone to, and I think it's because they're embarrassed for one. And also because they know that you're just going to try to, that's our assumption, you're just going to try to change my mind. You know, but that's part of being I'm a trying part. trying to win my brother. I'm trying to win my brother. It's part of being a part of a body. And when you when you disfellowship yourself, what you've done is you've thrown all that history out the window. You said it's worthless to me. And many of these people are people that you've walked through really hard times with. And, 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 and honestly, we owe each other, as brothers and sisters, we owe each other more than to disappear from our lives because things got a little sticky. Let's let's get through it. I think you come out stronger on the other side. I think the the Bible tells us that. Yeah. Yep. I recently uh uh signed up for the personal trainer at my gym mm-hmm. cuz I wanted some extra accountability. And I I'm paying this <clears throat> to get a little choked up. Oh no. <laughs> I'm paying this man to tell me what to do. Yeah. And most of it and this is where just to take this allegory even further Go of for the it. gym and the church. I'm paying this man to tell me what I already know to be true. I'm essentially I'm I'm warranting accountability from him. Yeah, I know chicken and rice every night. I got for it. my own success. <laughs> I've been in and out of the gym for I'm 29 years old. All, every I mean I've been in and out of the gym for 29 years. All right. Yeah, yeah. You look like it too. Yeah, you've been been in and out burger for 29 <laughs> years. That's what it looks like. That's what I'm saying. Because I'll go one time a week and expect that this is what we do we we go to church on sunday and most of the time we live right and then we allow ourselves one too many spiritual cheat meals mm. and just negates and you think wow. well i only send a little bit and it's like yeah but everybody else can tell you've been snacking okay we can see it <laughs> so anyways church discipline i i, I think uh, just to, to try to wrap this up in a, in a pretty bow not that it is pretty, but it is beautiful in that it's it, it spurs on health. Just to look at Ephesians 4 again, the purpose of speaking the truth in love is for the maturity of the body, for us to grow into the image of Jesus. And when you recognize when a brother comes to you saying, man, you have sinned, look at this scripture here. Oh my goodness, what a gift that you have people to help you in this journey to look like mm-hmm. Jesus and to please him. Yeah, nothing pretty starts out that way. I don't care what you say. You say this beautiful little baby. Hey man, I saw that baby. I saw how that baby came out. Ugly. And you know what? It was covered in a bunch of juice Your and chunks ugly. and stuff. That's nasty and <laughs> ugly. They all look the same, all right? You got to clean them off a little bit, all right? Anything beautiful didn't start out that way. It's got to be made that way. And that's what we can do with Christ as the head through the church. That's his design. Let's do it. Amen. Amen. Now, no matter what the world offers you, there is nobody can save you but Jesus.